Welcome to the Dr. Spooks channel. This is the place where horror and mystery stories take on a new, chilling twist. If you're looking for tales that will stick with you and haunt you even in your dreams, you're in the right spot. Our goal is to reach 1,000 subscribers, so subscribe now and hit the bell to prepare for the most terrifying experiences you won't find anywhere else. Dr. Spooks, where fear begins. It all began on a crisp autumn morning two years ago. The four of us, myself, Tom, Rachel, and Chris, had been friends since college, bonded by our shared love for the outdoors. We'd been on numerous camping trips together, but this time we were aiming for something grander. A week-long expedition to Yellowstone National Park. The planning phase was exciting. We spent countless evenings huddled around my dining room table, poring over maps, guidebooks, and online forums. Tom, always the organizer, created a detailed spreadsheet of our itinerary gear list and budget. Rachel, our resident biologist, was particularly thrilled about the prospect of seeing the park's diverse wildlife. Chris, the adventurous one, kept pushing for us to explore some of the less traveled areas of the park. As for me, I was just happy to be going on this trip with my closest friends. Life had been hectic lately with work and family commitments, and I was looking forward to disconnecting from the digital world and reconnecting with nature. We decided to drive from our hometown in Colorado, making it a road trip within a trip. The journey itself was memorable, filled with sing-alongs to 80s rock ballads, heated debates about the best trail mix combinations, and stops at quirky roadside attractions. Arriving at Yellowstone was like entering another world. The sheer scale of the place was overwhelming. We entered through the east entrance, and almost immediately we spotted a herd of bison grazing peacefully near the road. Rachel was in her element, rattling off facts about the animal's behavior and the park's ecosystem. Our first couple of days went exactly as planned. We set up camp at Bridge Bay Campground, which would serve as our base for exploring the southern part of the park. The campground was bustling with other visitors, creating a festive atmosphere. We spent our evenings exchanging stories with fellow campers from all over the world. During the day, we hit all the major attractions. Old Faithful was as impressive as we'd imagined, erupting with clockwork precision. The Grand Prismatic Spring left us in awe with its otherworldly colors. We hiked around the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, marveling at the thunderous waterfalls and the golden hues of the canyon walls. But it wasn't all sightseeing. We also had our share of small adventures. On our third day, while hiking near Mud Volcano, we had a close encounter with a young grizzly bear. We remembered our wilderness training, stay calm, make noise, and slowly back away. The bear seemed more curious than aggressive, and after a tense few minutes, it ambled off into the bushes. The experience left us exhilarated, but also more cautious. As we moved into the second half of our trip, we decided to be more spontaneous. We left Bridge Bay and headed north, planning to find campsites as we went along. This decision would lead us to the unforgettable events that would conclude our trip. We spent a day exploring the Lamar Valley, often called America's Serengeti, due to its abundant wildlife. We saw wolves in the distance, watched playful river otters, and even spotted a majestic elk. The vastness of the valley, with its sweeping vistas and diverse ecosystems, made us feel small in the grand scheme of nature. That night we camped at Slough Creek Campground. The stars were incredible, with the Milky Way stretching across the sky in a dazzling display. We stayed up late, identifying constellations and sharing our hopes and dreams for the future. The next day we decided to venture off the beaten path a bit. Chris had heard about some lesser-known geothermal features in a more remote area of the park. We spent the day hiking, marveling at bubbling mud pots and steaming fumaroles that few tourists ever see. As evening approached, we realized we had strayed quite far from any designated campgrounds. We weren't worried at first. We had our gear, and backcountry camping is allowed in Yellowstone with proper permits, which we had obtained as a precaution. However, as darkness fell, an uneasy feeling began to settle over us. The landscape seemed different in the twilight, less welcoming. We drove for what felt like hours, looking for a suitable place to camp or a way back to more populated areas. It was well past midnight when we finally came across a clearing that looked like it had been used for camping before. There were a few stone fire rings scattered around, and the ground was relatively flat. 
Exhausted and out of options, we decided to set up camp there. Setting up the tent in the dark was a challenge. We worked by the light of our headlamps and the car's headlights, our shadows dancing eerily on the surrounding trees. The usual banter and joking that accompanied our camp setups was absent, replaced by a tense silence broken only by necessary communication. Too tired to cook or even chat, we crawled into our sleeping bags almost immediately. The night was unusually quiet, no crickets chirping, no rustling of small animals in the underbrush. In retrospect, this silence should have been our first warning. I'm not sure how long I slept before I was shaken awake. Tom's face loomed over me, his expression a mix of confusion and fear. Listen, he whispered urgently. At first I heard nothing unusual. Then, as my senses sharpened, I noticed it. Bird calls. Lots of them, coming from all directions. This might not seem strange, except for two things. It was the middle of the night, hours away from dawn, and the calls didn't sound quite right. We woke Rachel and Chris, and all huddled in the tent, straining our ears. The bird sounds were varied. Some sounded like owls, others like songbirds, but the timing and rhythm were off. They seemed to be coming closer, then receding, almost like signals. Rachel, with her biology background, was the first to verbalize what we were all thinking. Those aren't birds, at least not all of them. The realization sent a chill down my spine. If they weren't birds, what were they? And more importantly, who was making these sounds? We decided to investigate, more out of a need to do something than any real hope of understanding what was happening. Quietly, we unzipped the tent and stepped out into the clearing. I understand. You want the story to remain realistic, similar to the original version. I'll revise the expanded story to keep it grounded in reality, removing any supernatural or overly dramatic elements. Here's a more realistic expansion of your original camping tale. The crisp mountain air filled my lungs as I stepped off the plane in Colorado. My college friends and I had been planning this camping trip for months, a tradition we'd kept alive since graduation to stay connected despite our busy lives. This year we'd chosen the rugged beauty of the Colorado mountains for our annual adventure. After collecting our luggage, we made our way to the rental car agency. The excitement was palpable as we loaded our gear into the trunk of a sturdy SUV, perfect for navigating the winding mountain roads ahead. As we pulled out of the airport, I couldn't help but feel a mix of anticipation and nostalgia. These trips were always a highlight of my year, a chance to reconnect with old friends and escape the hustle of everyday life. The drive into the mountains was breathtaking. Towering pines lined the roads, their branches reaching towards the clear blue sky. We chatted animatedly, catching up on each other's lives and reminiscing about our college days. As the elevation increased, the air grew cooler, and I felt a sense of peace wash over me. Our first night of camping was uneventful, spent in a bustling campground near a popular hiking trail. We shared stories around the campfire, roasted marshmallows, and gazed at the stars marveling at how much brighter they seemed away from the city lights. The next day we decided to venture deeper into the wilderness, seeking a more secluded spot for our second night. After hours of driving and exploring, we stumbled upon a small hidden campground. It was perfect individual lots spaced far apart, surrounded by dense forest, with a babbling creek nearby. We chose a spot close to the water, thinking it would be convenient for washing up after our hikes. As we set up camp, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. I dismissed it as paranoia, chalking it up to being in an unfamiliar environment. We worked efficiently, pitching our tent and organizing our gear while daylight still lingered. The sound of the creek and the rustling leaves created a soothing ambiance, and I felt my earlier unease begin to dissipate. With our campsite established, we decided to treat ourselves to dinner in the nearest town. The small mountain community was charming, with log cabins and local businesses lining the main street. We found a cozy restaurant and enjoyed hearty meals, swapping stories and laughing until our sides hurt. The sun had long since set by the time we returned to our campsite. As we approached, something felt off. The beams from our flashlights revealed our tent flap was open, swaying gently in the night breeze. A chill ran down my spine as we cautiously approached. It was clear someone or something had been through our belongings. Backpacks were unzipped, sleeping bags unfurled, and our food supplies scattered. 
We searched the surrounding area, but found no sign of the intruder. Despite the unsettling discovery, we decided to stay put for the night. After all, we reasoned, it was probably just some curious wildlife. To shake off the eerie feeling, we grabbed our toiletries and headed to the creek to freshen up before bed. The water was ice cold, shocking our systems as we quickly washed. As I was drying off, movement on the opposite bank caught my eye. Squinting into the darkness, I could make out a human-like figure standing motionless among the trees. My heart began to race. Not wanting to alarm my friends or alert the watcher, I casually suggested we head back to camp. Once we were out of earshot, I shared what I'd seen. The mood shifted instantly from relaxed to tense as we hurried back to our site. Given the earlier intrusion and my sighting by the creek, we unanimously decided to sleep in the car that night. It was cramped and uncomfortable, but felt infinitely safer than the exposed tent. Sleep came fitfully as we took turns keeping watch our eyes scanning the moonlit clearing for any sign of movement. In the dead of night I jolted awake, my senses on high alert. Peering out the window, my blood ran cold. A dark figure was crouched by our tent, slowly unzipping the entrance. I watched, paralyzed with fear as the intruder discovered the tent was empty. Then, to my horror, they turned towards our car. Adrenaline surged through me as I frantically shook my friends awake. In a moment of quick thinking, I lunged for the steering wheel and slammed my hand on the horn. The sudden piercing noise shattered the night's silence. What happened next haunts me to this day. Instead of fleeing in panic, the figure calmly stood up and walked away, disappearing into the thick forest without a hint of urgency. It was as if they were completely unfazed by our presence or the blaring horn. None of us slept for the remainder of the night. We sat in tense silence, eyes glued to the windows, jumping at every snapping twig or rustling leaf. As the first light of dawn broke through the trees, we breathed a collective sigh of relief. Without discussion, we began packing up our belongings. The campsite fee for the second night seemed a small price to pay for our safety. As we loaded the car, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were still being watched. The rest of our trip was spent at a different campground, one closer to civilization and other campers. While we tried to salvage our vacation, enjoying hikes and scenic views, an undercurrent of unease persisted. Every unexpected sound in the forest made us flinch, and we found ourselves constantly looking over our shoulders. On our final night gathered around the campfire, we finally discussed the events at the Creekside campground. Each of us shared our theories about who might have been stalking us. Was it a disturbed individual living in the woods, a thrill-seeker trying to scare campers, or perhaps a fellow camper with ill intentions. We never came to a conclusion, and in some ways the not knowing made it worse. The experience left an indelible mark on all of us. While we continued our annual camping trips in the years that followed, we were never quite as carefree as we had been before. As I sit here now, years later, recounting this story, I can still feel the icy grip of fear that seized me that night. The Colorado Mountains, once a symbol of adventure and freedom, now hold a darker significance in my memory. I've often wondered if other campers have had similar experiences in those woods, or if we were uniquely unfortunate. Our brush with the unknown served as a stark reminder of how vulnerable we can be in the wilderness, and how thin the line is between exhilarating adventure and genuine danger. It taught us to trust our instincts, to be prepared for the unexpected, and to never take our safety for granted. While I still love the outdoors and continue to seek out new adventures, I approach them with a heightened awareness of my surroundings. That night in Colorado taught me that sometimes the greatest threats aren't from wildlife or the elements, but from the unpredictable nature of other humans. As I finish recounting this tale, I find myself glancing out the window, half expecting to see a shadowy figure lurking at the edge of the tree line. The rational part of my mind knows it's just my imagination, but a small part of me will always wonder, what if it wasn't? Years ago, when I was in my prime, I found solace in the great outdoors of California. Camping was my escape, a way to shed the constraints of city life and immerse myself in nature's embrace. Almost every other weekend I'd pack up my gear and hit the road, seeking new adventures in the wilderness. My love for camping was matched only by my distaste for sleeping on the hard ground. After countless nights of tossing and turning in a tent, 
I decided to invest in a small camper that attached to the bed of my truck. It was a game changer, a cozy sanctuary that could comfortably accommodate me and a companion if needed. One crisp autumn Friday, I set out on a journey that would forever change my perspective on solo camping. I had chosen a destination about five hours from home, a pristine area I had yet to explore. The drive was long but scenic, winding through golden hills and dense forests. As I navigated the twisting roads, my anticipation grew with each passing mile. I arrived at my destination in the early afternoon, eager to make the most of the remaining daylight. The area was breathtaking, a tapestry of towering redwoods, crystal-clear streams, and wildflower-dotted meadows. I parked my truck at a trailhead and set out on a challenging hike, my boots crunching on the leaf-strewn path. The trail snaked its way up a mountain, offering glimpses of the vast wilderness below. I paused often to catch my breath and marvel at the view, feeling a sense of accomplishment with each step. After a few hours of steady climbing, I reached the summit, where I was rewarded with a panoramic vista that stretched for miles in every direction. I sat on a sun-warmed rock, munching on trail mix and drinking in the beauty around me. As the sun began its descent, I made my way back down the mountain, my legs burning pleasantly from the exertion. Near the base of the trail I stumbled upon a secluded lake, its surface a mirror reflecting the fiery colors of the sunset. Unable to resist, I shed my hiking boots and waded into the cool water, letting it soothe my tired feet. I lingered by the lake until twilight, watching as the first stars began to twinkle in the darkening sky. It was then that I decided to find a spot to camp for the night. I drove my truck up a winding dirt road, searching for the perfect location. After about twenty minutes I found an ideal clearing, elevated enough to provide a stunning view of the valley below, yet sheltered by a grove of ancient trees. I parked my truck and set about making my home for the night. The camper was a marvel of efficiency, with every inch of space utilized to its fullest. I unfolded the tiny kitchenette and prepared a simple dinner of canned soup and crackers, savoring the taste of a warm meal after a day of physical exertion. As night fell in earnest, I settled into my cozy bed with a paperback novel and a battery-powered lantern. The silence of the wilderness was broken only by the occasional hoot of an owl or the rustle of wind through the trees. It was in these moments that I felt most at peace, far removed from the chaos of everyday life. I must have been reading for an hour or so when I first heard it, the unmistakable sound of footsteps crunching on gravel. At first I dismissed it as my imagination, or perhaps a small animal foraging nearby, but as the sounds grew closer and more distinct, I felt a prickle of unease run down my spine. In all my years of camping, I had rarely encountered other people in such remote locations, especially after dark. I closed my book and held my breath, straining my ears to catch any further sounds. The footsteps continued slow and deliberate, circling my truck. My heart began to race as I considered my options. Should I call out? Pretend to be asleep? Make a run for it? Before I could decide, a raspy voice broke the silence. Hello there, it called, the words seeming to hang in the still night air. I just wanted to check out your camper. Pretty nifty. I swallowed hard, my mouth suddenly dry. The voice sounded male, with an odd, lilting quality that set me on edge. Summoning my courage, I called back, trying to keep my voice steady. Hi, I said, louder than necessary. I appreciate your interest, but it's late. I'd be happy to show you the camper in the morning if you're camping nearby. There was no immediate response, just an eerie silence that seemed to stretch on forever. Then I heard muttering, low and indistinct, but clearly coming from just outside my camper. I couldn't make out the words, but the tone sent chills down my spine. I tried to return to my book, hoping that whoever was out there would take the hint and leave, but the footsteps didn't retreat. Instead, they began to move around my truck, slow and purposeful. I could hear them crunching on the gravel, pausing occasionally before continuing their circuit. My camper had small, porthole-like windows on each side, covered with curtains for privacy. With trembling hands, I peeled back one of the curtains just a fraction, peering out into the darkness. The moon had risen, casting a pale light over the clearing, but I couldn't see anyone. The footsteps had moved to the front of my truck, out of my line of sight. I was debating whether to turn on my exterior lights when I heard it. 
a soft thump on the hood of my truck. My blood ran cold as I realized what was happening. Whoever was out there had climbed onto my vehicle and was now crawling across the roof towards the camper. Anger flared within me, momentarily overshadowing my fear. I took pride in my truck, meticulously maintaining it, and the thought of some stranger damaging it infuriated me. Without thinking, I shouted out, my voice echoing in the quiet night. Hey, I have a firearm in here, I warned, trying to sound more confident than I felt. If you don't get off my truck and leave right now, I'm coming out with my gun. The thumping on the roof ceased immediately, followed by the sound of someone scrambling off the vehicle. I heard footsteps retreating, but they didn't fade away completely. Whoever it was hadn't left the area. My heart pounding, I reached for the small safe where I kept my firearm. With shaking hands, I entered the combination and retrieved the gun, along with a powerful flashlight. I took a deep breath, steeling myself for what I might find outside. Slowly, I opened the camper door and climbed out, my eyes darting around the clearing. I swept the flashlight in a wide arc, its beam cutting through the darkness. At first I saw nothing but trees and underbrush. Then a movement caught my eye. About forty feet away, crouched near a large bush, was a figure. As my flashlight illuminated him, I caught a glimpse of wild eyes and unkempt hair before he backed further into the shadows. Was this some drug-addled wanderer, a dangerous criminal, or simply a lost soul with no sense of boundaries? Regardless of his reasons, I had had enough. Leave now, I shouted, my voice carrying across the clearing. Don't come back, or I'll call the authorities. The figure retreated further into the darkness, but I could still sense his presence. He hadn't gone far. A wave of exhaustion washed over me as the adrenaline began to subside. I was supposed to drive home in the morning anyway, and there was no way I could sleep peacefully here now. With one eye always on the surrounding forest, I quickly packed up my belongings and secured the camper. Every rustle of leaves, every snapping twig made me jump. As I climbed into the driver's seat, I caught movement in my peripheral vision, the figure still lurking at the edge of the clearing. I started the engine, its rumble shattering the night's silence. As I began to drive away, my headlights swept across the area where I had last seen the man. For a brief moment, I saw him clearly. Gaunt face, matted beard, clothes hanging in tatters. But it was his eyes that haunted me, wide and gleaming with an unsettling intensity. As I navigated the winding road back to civilization, my mind raced with questions. Who was that man? What did he want? What might have happened if I hadn't been prepared? The what-ifs plagued me for miles until the first signs of dawn began to lighten the sky. I stopped at a 24-hour diner just off the highway, desperately in need of coffee and a moment to collect myself. As I sat in a worn vinyl booth, hands wrapped around a steaming mug, I reflected on the night's events. The encounter had shaken me, but it had also reinforced the importance of being prepared and trusting one's instincts. In the years that followed, I continued to camp, but never again with the same carefree attitude. I became more cautious, more aware of my surroundings. I invested in better security measures for my camper and always made sure someone knew my exact location and expected return time. That night in the California wilderness taught me a valuable lesson about the unpredictability of human nature and the importance of self-reliance. While I never again encountered anything quite as unsettling, the memory of those footsteps in the dark, that raspy voice and those gleaming eyes stayed with me. As I sit here now, years removed from that night, I can't help but wonder about the man in the forest. Was he simply a lonely soul seeking connection in all the wrong ways? Or was there something more sinister at play? I'll never know for certain, but I'm grateful for the wake-up call it provided. For those who venture into the wilderness, whether for a weekend or a lifetime, remember this. Nature's beauty is unparalleled, but it's not without its dangers, both natural and human. Stay alert. Trust your instincts and always be prepared. The wilderness can be a place of solace and adventure, but it demands respect and caution in equal measure. As for me, while I may not camp as frequently as I once did, I still find solace in nature. But now, when I gaze up at the star-filled sky or listen to the wind whisper through the trees, I do so with a heightened awareness of the thin line between solitude and isolation, between peace and vulnerability. 
That night in California may have changed me, but it didn't break my spirit or my love for the outdoors. Instead, it taught me to appreciate the beauty around me while never forgetting the importance of vigilance. And in the end, isn't that what true wilderness experience is all about? Finding the balance between awe and awareness, between freedom and caution. So to all the solo campers out there, I say this. Embrace the adventure, revel in the solitude, but never forget that in the vast wilderness you are not always alone. And sometimes it's the unseen presence that leaves the most lasting impression. The rhythmic crunch of gravel under our tires signaled our arrival at the familiar lakeside cabin. As I stepped out of the car, the scent of pine and fresh water filled my lungs, instantly transporting me to a world away from the bustling city life we'd left behind. It was late July, and our monthly family gathering at the lake had grown into something larger this time around. Our cabin, a weathered wooden structure that had stood the test of time and countless family memories, seemed to welcome us with open arms. Its wraparound porch, adorned with mismatched rocking chairs, creaked softly as we unloaded our gear. The late afternoon sun cast long shadows across the yard, where my younger cousins were already engaged in an impromptu game of tag. Inside, the cabin was a hive of activity. Aunts and uncles bustled about, unpacking groceries and debating dinner plans. The living room with its stone fireplace and well-worn leather sofas, quickly filled with laughter and animated conversations. It was clear that this weekend would be one for the books. As the youngest of the older kids, I found myself in a unique position, too old to join the little ones in their games, yet not quite ready to settle into the adult conversations. I gravitated towards my siblings and their friends. My older brother, a college sophomore with an easy smile and a penchant for adventure, was already discussing sleeping arrangements with his girlfriend. My younger brother, all gangly limbs and nervous energy, hovered nearby, eager to be included. It didn't take long for us to realize that the sleeping situation inside the cabin would be tight. With a mischievous glint in his eye, my older brother suggested we pitch a tent on the beach. The idea was met with enthusiasm by our little group, and after a quick okay from our parents, we set about making it happen. The beach was a thin strip of sand that separated the grassy lawn from the lake's edge. It wasn't much, but it was ours. As we hammered tent stakes into the sand, I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement. This was freedom, even if it was just a few yards from the cabin. As the sun began to set, casting a palette of oranges and pinks across the sky, the smell of grilled burgers and corn on the cob wafted from the cabin's small kitchen. We gathered on the porch, paper plates balanced precariously on our laps, savoring the simple meal and the company of family. Stories were shared, jokes were told, and plans were made for the days ahead. After dinner, as the younger kids were ushered off to bed, we older ones gravitated towards the fire pit. My uncle, a master storyteller, regaled us with tales of his youth spent on this very lake. He spoke of midnight swims, of fish so big they nearly capsized his boat, and of the ghostly loon calls that echoed across the water on still nights. As the fire died down to embers and the mosquitoes became more persistent, we retreated to our tent. The air mattresses squeaked beneath us as we settled in, hushed giggles and whispered conversations filling the darkness. Through the mesh of the tent, I could see the stars twinkling brightly, unobscured by city lights. The gentle lapping of waves against the shore provided a soothing backdrop, and soon we drifted off to sleep. I'm not sure how long I had been asleep when I was jolted awake by an unfamiliar sound. At first I thought it might be the wind, or perhaps a large fish jumping in the lake. But as I lay there, fully alert now, I realized it was the low hum of a boat engine. Fishing at night wasn't uncommon on our lake. In fact, some of the best catches were said to happen under the cover of darkness. But something about this particular engine sound set me on edge. It was too close far closer than any respectful fisherman would venture to the shoreline at night. I nudged my older brother awake, whispering urgently about the strange noise. He listened for a moment, his brow furrowing in confusion. Without a word, we carefully extricated ourselves from our sleeping bags, trying not to wake the others. The night air was cool against my skin as we unzipped the tent and stepped out onto the beach. The moon nearly full, cast an eerie glow across the water. 
We made our way to the dock, our bare feet silent on the wooden planks. What we saw next is something I'll never forget. A fishing boat, its engine humming quietly, was drifting slowly past our property. But what made my breath catch in my throat was the fact that the boat appeared to be completely empty. We stood, rooted to the spot, as the ghostly vessel continued its eerie journey. The moonlight glinted off its metal surface, creating an almost ethereal glow. As we watched, the gentle waves gradually guided the boat towards our neighbor's beach. The silence of the night was suddenly shattered by a cacophony of barks. Our neighbor's dog, a large German shepherd named Max, had obviously sensed something amiss and was raising the alarm. Within seconds our own dogs joined in, their barks echoing across the water. Startled into action, my brother and I hurried back down the dock. We were about to head up the hill to the cabin when movement caught my eye. From the inky shadows of our neighbor's property, a figure emerged. My heart leapt into my throat as I took in the surreal sight. The figure was clad entirely in black, a wetsuit clinging to their form. Their face was obscured by a mask and goggles, giving them an otherworldly appearance. Time seemed to slow as the figure sprinted past us, no more than ninety feet away. Despite the warm summer night, I felt a chill run through my body. The figure moved with purpose, making a beeline for the previously empty boat. In a matter of seconds, the mysterious intruder had boarded the vessel and fired up the engine. As the boat began to pull away from the shore, the figure turned towards us. Even from a distance I could feel their gaze upon us, standing frozen on the beach. Then, in a spray of water, they were gone, disappearing into the vastness of the lake. My brother and I stood in stunned silence for what felt like an eternity. The dogs continued to bark, but it seemed distant, as if coming from another world. Eventually we gathered our wits enough to return to the tent, though sleep eluded us for the rest of the night. As the first light of dawn began to creep across the sky, we heard commotion from the direction of our neighbor's cabin. Voices raised in alarm, car doors slamming, and the unmistakable wail of approaching sirens broke the morning stillness. We emerged from our tent to find the adults already gathered on the porch, looks of concern etched on their faces. Our neighbor, Mr. Johnson, was pacing back and forth, gesticulating wildly as he spoke to a police officer. It didn't take long for the story to emerge. The Johnson's cabin had been broken into during the night. The intruder had managed to disable their security system and had been in the process of gathering valuables when Max, their loyal German shepherd, had raised the alarm. The burglar had fled empty-handed, but the sense of violation was palpable. Years ago, when I was in my prime, I found solace in the great outdoors of California. Camping was my escape, a way to shed the constraints of city life and immerse myself in nature's embrace. Almost every other weekend I'd pack up my gear and hit the road, seeking new adventures in the wilderness. My love for camping was matched only by my distaste for sleeping on the hard ground. After countless nights of tossing and turning in a tent, I decided to invest in a small camper that attached to the bed of my truck. It was a game-changer, a cozy sanctuary that could comfortably accommodate me and a companion if needed. One crisp autumn Friday I set out on a journey that would forever change my perspective on solo camping. I had chosen a destination about five hours from home, a pristine area I had yet to explore. The drive was long but scenic, winding through golden hills and dense forests. As I navigated the twisting roads, my anticipation grew with each passing mile. I arrived at my destination in the early afternoon, eager to make the most of the remaining daylight. The area was breathtaking a tapestry of towering redwoods, crystal-clear streams, and wildflower-dotted meadows. I parked my truck at a trailhead and set out on a challenging hike, my boots crunching on the leaf-strewn path. The trail snaked its way up a mountain, offering glimpses of the vast wilderness below. I paused often to catch my breath and marvel at the view, feeling a sense of accomplishment with each step. After a few hours of steady climbing, I reached the summit, where I was rewarded with a panoramic vista that stretched for miles in every direction. I sat on a sun-warmed rock, munching on trail mix and drinking in the beauty around me. As the sun began its descent, I made my way back down the mountain, my legs burning pleasantly from the exertion. Near the base of the trail I stumbled upon a secluded lake, its surface a mirror reflecting the fiery colors of the sunset. 
Unable to resist, I shed my hiking boots and waded into the cool water, letting it soothe my tired feet. I lingered by the lake until twilight, watching as the first stars began to twinkle in the darkening sky. It was then that I decided to find a spot to camp for the night. I drove my truck up a winding dirt road, searching for the perfect location. After about twenty minutes, I found an ideal clearing, elevated enough to provide a stunning view of the valley below, yet sheltered by a grove of ancient trees. I parked my truck and set about making my home for the night. The camper was a marvel of efficiency, with every inch of space utilized to its fullest. I unfolded the tiny kitchenette and prepared a simple dinner of canned soup and crackers, savoring the taste of a warm meal after a day of physical exertion. As night fell in earnest, I settled into my cozy bed with a paperback novel and a battery-powered lantern. The silence of the wilderness was broken only by the occasional hoot of an owl or the rustle of wind through the trees. It was in these moments that I felt most at peace, far removed from the chaos of everyday life. I must have been reading for an hour or so when I first heard it, the unmistakable sound of footsteps crunching on gravel. At first I dismissed it as my imagination, or perhaps a small animal foraging nearby, but as the sounds grew closer and more distinct, I felt a prickle of unease run down my spine. In all my years of camping, I had rarely encountered other people in such remote locations, especially after dark. I closed my book and held my breath, straining my ears to catch any further sounds. The footsteps continued slow and deliberate, circling my truck. My heart began to race as I considered my options. Should I call out? Pretend to be asleep? Make a run for it? Before I could decide, a raspy voice broke the silence. Hello there, it called, the words seeming to hang in the still night air. I just wanted to check out your camper. Pretty nifty. I swallowed hard, my mouth suddenly dry. The voice sounded male, with an odd, lilting quality that set me on edge. Summoning my courage, I called back, trying to keep my voice steady. Hi, I said, louder than necessary. I appreciate your interest, but it's late. I'd be happy to show you the camper in the morning if you're camping nearby. There was no immediate response, just an eerie silence that seemed to stretch on forever. Then I heard muttering, low and indistinct, but clearly coming from just outside my camper. I couldn't make out the words, but the tone sent chills down my spine. I tried to return to my book, hoping that whoever was out there would take the hint and leave, but the footsteps didn't retreat. Instead, they began to move around my truck, slow and purposeful. I could hear them crunching on the gravel, pausing occasionally before continuing their circuit. My camper had small, porthole-like windows on each side, covered with curtains for privacy. With trembling hands, I peeled back one of the curtains just a fraction, peering out into the darkness. The moon had risen, casting a pale light over the clearing, but I couldn't see anyone. The footsteps had moved to the front of my truck, out of my line of sight. I was debating whether to turn on my exterior lights when I heard it, a soft thump on the hood of my truck. My blood ran cold as I realized what was happening. Whoever was out there had climbed onto my vehicle and was now crawling across the roof towards the camper. Anger flared within me, momentarily overshadowing my fear. I took pride in my truck, meticulously maintaining it, and the thought of some stranger damaging it infuriated me. Without thinking, I shouted out, my voice echoing in the quiet night. Hey, I have a firearm in here, I warned, trying to sound more confident than I felt. If you don't get off my truck and leave right now, I'm coming out with my gun. The thumping on the roof ceased immediately, followed by the sound of someone scrambling off the vehicle. I heard footsteps retreating, but they didn't fade away completely. Whoever it was hadn't left the area. My heart pounding, I reached for the small safe where I kept my firearm. With shaking hands, I entered the combination and retrieved the gun, along with a powerful flashlight. I took a deep breath stealing myself for what I might find outside. Slowly I opened the camper door and climbed out, my eyes darting around the clearing. I swept the flashlight in a wide arc, its beam cutting through the darkness. At first I saw nothing but trees and underbrush. Then a movement caught my eye. About forty feet away, crouched near a large bush, was a figure. As my flashlight illuminated him, I caught a glimpse of wild eyes and unkempt hair, before he backed further into the shadows. 
Was this some drug-addled wanderer, a dangerous criminal, or simply a lost soul with no sense of boundaries? Regardless of his reasons, I had had enough. Leave now, I shouted, my voice carrying across the clearing. Don't come back, or I'll call the authorities. The figure retreated further into the darkness, but I could still sense his presence. He hadn't gone far. A wave of exhaustion washed over me as the adrenaline began to subside. I was supposed to drive home in the morning anyway, and there was no way I could sleep peacefully here now. With one eye always on the surrounding forest, I quickly packed up my belongings and secured the camper. Every rustle of leaves, every snapping twig made me jump. As I climbed into the driver's seat, I caught movement in my peripheral vision, the figure still lurking at the edge of the clearing. As my brother and I recounted what we had witnessed, the gravity of the situation began to sink in. The police listened intently, jotting down notes and exchanging significant looks. They praised us for our observance but cautioned us against taking any risks in the future. Next time, the officer said gravely, call 911 immediately. The rest of the day passed in a blur of police interviews, concerned phone calls from relatives who had heard the news, and hushed conversations among the adults. The carefree atmosphere of the previous evening had evaporated, replaced by a tense vigilance. As night fell once again, no one suggested sleeping in the tent. Instead, we crowded into the cabin, doors locked and windows secured. Sleep came fitfully, if at all, for most of us. The next few days saw a flurry of activity around the lake. Additional security measures were discussed and implemented. Motion sensor lights were installed, and a neighborhood watch program was hastily organized. The once peaceful lakeside community had been shaken to its core. As the weekend drew to a close and we prepared to return to our everyday lives, I couldn't shake the feeling that something fundamental had changed. The lake, once a symbol of carefree summer days and family togetherness, now held a hint of danger, a reminder that the outside world could intrude even here. In the weeks and months that followed, life gradually returned to normal. We continued our monthly visits to the cabin but there was an undercurrent of caution that hadn't existed before. The younger children were no longer allowed to roam freely after dark, and midnight swims became a thing of the past. The incident became something of a legend among our family and friends. Each retelling seemed to add new details, the danger becoming more immediate, the escape more narrow. My brother and I found ourselves at the center of these tales, our roles shifting from scared witnesses to heroic observers who had thwarted a master criminal. As for me, I found myself drawn more and more to the water's edge as night fell. I would stand on the dock, watching the moonlight dance on the gentle waves, half expecting to see that mysterious boat drift by once more. It never did, of course, but the memory of that night remained vivid in my mind. In time the fear faded, replaced by a sense of wonder at the mysteries that lurk in the shadows of even the most familiar places. Our lakeside cabin, once a simple retreat, had become a place of legend, its history enriched by our midnight encounter. Years have passed since that summer night, and much has changed. The cabin has been renovated and expanded, the old tent long since replaced by a sturdy boathouse. The younger generation now brings their own children to enjoy the lake, creating new memories and traditions. But still, on quiet nights when the moon is full and the lake is like glass, I find myself remembering. I think about the figure in the wetsuit, the empty boat drifting by, and the way a single night can alter our perceptions forever. Our family still gathers at the lake, drawn by the bonds of kinship and the allure of this special place. We still share meals and laughter, still create new memories with each visit. But always, as the sun dips below the horizon and the first stars appear in the sky, there is a moment of quiet reflection, a moment where we remember that night in late July, when the boundary between the ordinary and the extraordinary blurred, leaving us with a story that would be told and retold for generations to come. And sometimes in the deepest part of the night, when the loons call hauntingly across the water and the wind whispers through the pines, I wonder. I wonder about the person in the wetsuit, about their story and what drove them to such desperate acts. I wonder if they ever think about that night, about the two young people they encountered on the beach. And I wonder if, like me, 
they were forever changed by our brief, silent encounter under the summer moon. Life has a funny way of changing course when you least expect it. For me, that change came on a lonely stretch of highway in the dead of night. But to understand how I ended up there, we need to go back a bit. My name is Jack Miller. Up until three months ago, I was living what most would consider a perfectly ordinary life in Seattle. I had a steady job as a software developer at a mid-sized tech company, a comfortable apartment downtown, and a small but close group of friends. My days were filled with code, coffee, and the occasional weekend hike in the nearby mountains. It wasn't exciting, but it was stable, and I thought I was content. Then came the layoffs. Our company had been struggling, but none of us expected the sudden announcement that half the workforce would be let go. I was among them. Just like that, the stability I had taken for granted was gone. The next few weeks were a blur of job applications, rejected interviews, and mounting bills. The tech industry in Seattle was saturated, and competition for jobs was fierce. It was during this time that I received a call from my sister, Emma. She was getting married in Florida and wanted me to be there. Under normal circumstances, I would have booked a flight without hesitation. But with my savings dwindling and no job prospects in sight, the cost of airfare seemed like an unnecessary luxury. That's when the idea hit me. Why not drive? I had time on my hands, and the thought of a cross-country road trip held a certain appeal. It would be cheaper than flying, and maybe the change of scenery would help clear my head, give me a new perspective on things. I spent the next week preparing for the journey. I tuned up my old Honda Civic, packed a duffel bag with clothes, and loaded up my laptop with audiobooks and podcasts to keep me company on the long drive. As I plotted my route on a map, I felt a spark of excitement for the first time in months. This wasn't just a trip to a wedding. It was an adventure, a chance to see parts of the country I'd only ever flown over. The first few days of the drive were everything I'd hoped for. I cruised through the lush forests of Oregon, marveled at the stark beauty of the Utah desert, and found myself humming along to country music as I passed through small towns in Colorado. I stopped at quirky roadside attractions, ate at greasy spoon diners, and spent nights in cheap motels with flickering neon signs. For the first time since losing my job, I felt free. The open road stretched out before me, full of possibilities. I even started to toy with the idea of not returning to Seattle after the wedding. Maybe I'd find a job in a smaller town, somewhere with a lower cost of living, or perhaps I'd freelance, working remotely from wherever I felt like settling for a while. But as I crossed into the Midwest, the novelty of the trip began to wear off. The landscapes became flatter, the towns more spread out. I found myself driving for hours without seeing another car, the monotony broken only by the occasional truck stop or gas station. It was on the fourth night of my journey that things took a turn. I had been pushing myself hard, trying to make good time. I wanted to arrive in Florida with a day or two to spare before the wedding, to help Emma with any last-minute preparations. I had been on the road for nearly 16 hours straight, fueled by gas station coffee and energy drinks. The sun had long since set, and I was somewhere in the middle of Kansas. The highway stretched out before me, a dark ribbon cutting through endless fields. My eyelids felt heavy, and I was considering pulling over at the next rest stop to catch a few hours of sleep. That's when I first noticed the headlights in my rearview mirror. They appeared suddenly, as if the vehicle had materialized out of thin air. At first I didn't think much of it. It was just another traveler on this lonely stretch of road, probably as eager as I was to reach their destination. But as the minutes ticked by, I realized something wasn't right. The vehicle behind me, a large truck, from what I could make out in the darkness, was getting closer, much closer than was comfortable or safe. I tapped my brakes, hoping the driver would take the hint and back off. Instead, the truck surged forward, its grille now filling my rearview mirror. My heart began to race. What was this guy's problem? I pressed down on the accelerator, watching the speedometer climb, 70, 75, 80 miles per hour, but no matter how fast I went, the truck stayed right on my tail, its headlights blazing. That's when the real fear set in. This wasn't just an impatient driver or someone not paying attention. This was deliberate. But why? What did this person want? My mind raced through possibilities, each more terrifying than the last. 
I spotted a sign for an upcoming rest stop and made a split-second decision. I'd pull in there where there might be other people around. Safety in numbers, right? As I took the exit, the truck followed. I cursed under my breath, hands shaking as I navigated the dark, twisting road leading to the rest area. The parking lot came into view, illuminated by a single flickering street light. My heart sank. It was empty. Not a single car or person in sight. The isolation that had seemed peaceful earlier now felt oppressive and threatening. I pulled into a spot near the restroom building, killing the engine. The truck's headlights flooded my rearview mirror, blinding me. I squeezed my eyes shut, heart pounding in my ears. This was it. Whatever was going to happen would happen now. Seconds ticked by, each feeling like an eternity. I could hear the low rumble of the truck's engine, a menacing growl in the silence of the night. And then, suddenly, silence. The light behind me vanished. Slowly, I opened my eyes and turned around. The parking lot was empty. No truck, no headlights, nothing but darkness and the faint buzz of the streetlight above. I sat there, frozen for what felt like hours. My mind struggled to process what had just happened. Had I imagined it all? Was I so exhausted that I'd hallucinated a threatening truck? Eventually, I gathered the courage to step out of my car. The cool night air hit my face, helping to clear my head. I walked a lap around the parking lot, half expecting the truck to reappear at any moment. But there was no sign it had ever been there. No tire tracks, no lingering exhaust fumes, nothing. As the adrenaline began to fade, exhaustion crept back in. I decided to try to get some sleep in my car before continuing my journey. I reclined the seat and closed my eyes, but sleep wouldn't come. Every time I started to drift off, I'd jerk awake, certain I'd heard the rumble of an engine or seen a flash of headlights. The sky was just beginning to lighten when I gave up on sleep. I needed coffee if I was going to make it the rest of the way home. I started the car and pulled out of the rest stop, constantly checking my mirrors for any sign of the truck. The highway was still eerily empty as I merged back onto it. My nerves were shot and every vehicle I saw in the distance made my heart rate spike. But none of them were the truck that had chased me. About an hour later, I spotted a 24-hour diner just off the highway. The parking lot was half full, a welcome sight after the emptiness of the night. I pulled in, desperate for caffeine and human contact. The bell above the door jingled as I entered, the sound almost startling in its normalcy. A few heads turned to look at me, then went back to their own conversations or plates of food. I slid into a booth near the window, still able to keep an eye on my car and the highway beyond. A waitress approached, coffee pot in hand. Her name tag read Betty, and she had the weary but kind look of someone who'd seen it all on the night shift. Rough night? she asked, eyeing my disheveled appearance as she filled my cup. I nodded, wrapping my hands around the warm mug. You could say that. Had a bit of a scare on the highway. She raised an eyebrow. Curiosity peaked. Oh? What happened? I hesitated, suddenly feeling foolish. How could I explain what I'd experienced without sounding crazy? But something in Betty's expression told me she might understand. There was this truck, I began, my voice low. It followed me for miles, riding my bumper. No matter how fast I went or which lane I took, it stayed right behind me. When I pulled over at a rest stop, it just vanished. I expected her to laugh it off or give me a patronizing smile, but instead Betty's expression changed. A flicker of recognition passed through her eyes. She glanced around the diner, then leaned in closer. You're not the first to come through here with a story like that, she said in a low voice. My blood ran cold. What do you mean? Betty sighed, sliding into the seat across from me. She looked tired, but there was an intensity in her eyes that hadn't been there before. In the past few months, we've had a handful of drivers stop in here, all shaken up about a truck that chased them on the highway, always at night, always on that same stretch you came in on. I leaned forward, hanging on her every word. Did they see who was driving it? She shook her head, a grim expression on her face. That's the thing. No one ever sees a driver, and the truck always disappears without a trace. It's like it's not quite real, you know. A chill ran down my spine. What, what do you think it means? Betty shrugged, but her eyes were serious. 
I don't know, but there's been a string of robberies on that highway lately. Cars found abandoned, drivers missing. Police haven't been able to catch whoever's behind it. My mind reeled, trying to connect the dots. A phantom truck, disappearing drivers, unsolved robberies. It was like something out of a nightmare. Has anyone reported this truck to the police? I asked, though I already suspected the answer. Betty nodded, a hint of frustration in her voice. A few have tried, but without any evidence and with the truck always vanishing. Well, let's just say the police aren't taking it too seriously. They think it's just tired drivers seeing things or maybe some local kids playing pranks. I sat back, processing this information. Part of me felt relieved that I wasn't the only one who had experienced this, that I wasn't going crazy, but a larger part was terrified. What was really going on out there on that lonely stretch of highway? Betty must have seen the fear in my eyes. She reached out and patted my hand, her touch surprisingly comforting. Look, you made it here safe. That's what matters. My advice? Stick to driving during the day if you can. And if you see that truck again, get somewhere public as fast as you can. Don't try to outrun it. Don't pull over in the middle of nowhere. Just find people. Lots of people. I nodded, grateful for her kindness and the warning. As she stood to get back to work, a thought occurred to me. Wait, I called after her. You said there have been robberies, missing drivers. But I wasn't robbed. The truck didn't even stop when I pulled over. Why? Betty turned back, and the grim expression on her face sent a new wave of fear through me. Maybe you got lucky, she said slowly. Or maybe, maybe they were just scouting, learning your habits, your reactions. For next time. With that chilling thought, she walked away leaving me alone with my cooling coffee and racing thoughts. I stayed at the diner far longer than I'd planned, nursing cup after cup of coffee as I watched the sun rise fully. The normalcy of the morning rush helped ground me, reminding me that the world wasn't all dark highways and phantom trucks. When I finally got back on the road, I felt more in control. The highway looked different in the daylight, less menacing, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched that somewhere out there the driver of that ghost truck was waiting for another opportunity. I made it to Emma's wedding without further incident, but the experience stayed with me. In the days that followed, I found myself jumpy and distracted. Every unexpected noise made me flinch, and I had trouble sleeping, plagued by nightmares of endless highways and pursuing headlights. After the wedding, I decided to fly back to Seattle instead of driving. The thought of facing that highway again was too much to bear. But even back in the familiar surroundings of my apartment, I couldn't shake the memory of that night. I found myself researching highway robberies in the area, looking for patterns or clues. The more I dug, the more unsettling stories I uncovered. Reports of vehicles found abandoned, their drivers vanished without a trace. Whispered accounts of a truck that appeared out of nowhere and disappeared just as quickly. I even considered reporting my experience to the police, but always stopped short. What could I tell them that wouldn't sound completely insane? Officer, I was chased by a ghost truck that vanished into thin air. I could almost hear the skepticism in their voices. Weeks passed, and slowly the intensity of that night began to fade. I still avoided driving long distances at night, but the constant fear subsided. Life went on. I eventually found a new job, threw myself into work, trying to push the memory of that night to the back of my mind. Then, about a month after my encounter, I saw a news report that made my blood run cold. A car had been found abandoned on that same highway, the driver missing. The details were eerily similar to the stories Betty had told me at the diner. As I stared at the TV screen, a chill ran down my spine. I couldn't help but wonder, had I really escaped that night? Or had I just postponed the inevitable? The image of the abandoned car on the news seemed to mock me, a grim reminder of what could have been, what might still be waiting for me out there. The highway stretched out before me, a dark ribbon cutting through the night. But now every set of headlights in my rearview mirror made me flinch. Every truck that passed sent my heart racing. The once peaceful solitude of a late-night drive had been shattered, replaced by a constant gnawing fear. I found myself avoiding long drives, making excuses to stay close to home. When I did have to travel, I meticulously planned my routes to stick to busy, well-lit roads. I installed a dash cam in my car, 
hoping that if I ever encountered the phantom truck again, I'd at least have some evidence. But even as I took these precautions, a part of me knew they might be futile. If what I'd experienced was something beyond the ordinary, would any of this really make a difference? I knew one thing for certain. I would never look at an empty highway the same way again, because now I knew that sometimes, in the dead of night, those highways aren't as empty as they seem, and the things that lurk in the darkness don't always disappear when you turn to face them. As time passed, the memory of that night remained vivid, a constant reminder of the inexplicable and the dangerous. I often found myself wondering about the other drivers who had encountered the phantom truck. What had become of them? Had they managed to move on with their lives, or were they, like me, forever changed by their experience? And what of the missing drivers? Were they victims of ordinary crime, or was there something more sinister at play? The questions haunted me, unanswered and perhaps unanswerable. In the end, all I could do was stay vigilant, always watching the rearview mirror, always wary of the shadows on the road. Because out there, somewhere in the night, I knew the phantom truck was still roaming, waiting, watching, ready to emerge from the darkness once again. Thus we reach the end of our episode today. If this story receives your engagement, I will continue telling it and bring you more similar thrilling tales. Thank you for watching and have a good night.